What an extraordinary ordeal you've been through. The thing I think I, that struck me most about it was you would not have even been aware of quite what your wife was doing on your behalf here, but I really believe that her relentless pursuit of justice for you mm. was what, in the end, got the media attention, which probably provoked your release. Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree. Um, and I didn't really know the extent to which... to what, what was actually going on behind the scenes. It was only when I went out on bail and when I've returned back to the UK when I've actually seen, you know, what... not chaos, not what circus, but how much attention she was able to drum up and how how instrumental that was in my release. Mm. Um, you went out um, to the UAE in April this year and in May you were arrested mm. at the airport. You were doing research for part of your PhD. Correct. You were accused of spying on behalf of a foreign power and thrown into solitary confinement. What was the next five and a half months like? Uh, tough, really tough. Um, uh, the solitary confinement is, is such a... Uh, it's such a hard ordeal, such a hard punishment to face. Um, Did you have any connection with the outside world? Do you have any internet, any television? Any... <laughs> so at the start, I was allowed to have a, like less than a five minute phone call that's supervised on loudspeaker with about four or five guards. Then after a few weeks, I was allowed to speak to Danny on the phone every week for again, for five minutes. And having that, that like glimmer of hope, I never wanted to upset that balance. Mm. I never wanted to think actually, I. I need to go back here, I need to change what I've said. Because all I'd look forward to was the next phone call on a Thursday to, to Danny. Um, after I went to hospital in October, September, October, I was then allowed a TV. When I returned back to my, uh, the place where I was being detained, they put a TV in there and then they put, uh, they gave me a book. So right. you basically thought it was better to cooperate 100%. rather than protest your innocence because it was contact with your wife and the outside world through perks like a television that would keep you going. Uh, not just that. It was the options I was given, and this is their words, it was, I had two paths ahead of me. There was one of cooperation, one where I could, you know, they would say they would commute my sentence, that I would, I would be fine, all I had to do was admit guilt and, and so forth. And the other option were um, threats of torture, physical torture and intimidation. Did um, you get tortured at all? Physically, no, but I felt that what they were doing to me with the medicine, with the isolation, with the threats, that felt like a form of torture. What, what, yeah. sorry, please, but what torture did you know that you would face? Uh, so I actually heard people being tortured in the, uh, in the premises I was in. Um, one, one time I went into another room and I saw someone's footprints on the wall upside down at about head level mm -hmm. and you don't understand how that can happen, if for any other reason, apart from torture. I know they, they do torture people in the UA and there've been many examples of this happening, um, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, but also due to my own research, uh, looking at, you know, Human Rights Watch and, and so forth, that this is something that, that does happen routinely. They threaten to uh, illegally rendition me to an overseas military base where they would beat and torture me. Um, it's something that happens, uh, not only in the UAE, but in a lot of Middle Eastern countries. And you went through all this, you try to cooperate, and mm. then they basically throw the keys away. They say life imprisonment. That moment for you mm. must have been horrific. Yeah, the, those, next, those next few days weren't, uh, weren't fun at all, especially as I returned from court. The next day I was actually interrogated again. So I wasn't taken to a prison, I was taken back to the same cell, the same room I was in. For the whole of my duration, I thought, you know, what's going on. If there's supposed to be some form of due process, why am I being taken back to the but, same but room? when you there? heard that this was life in prison? Yeah. I mean, what were you thinking? I didn't know what to think for, for days. Um, on that weekend, I, I had suicidal thoughts um, because nothing, nothing made sense at all. That wasn't the only time I had uh, suicidal thoughts, but that was really uh, down the end of a black hole. Meanwhile, Daniela, I mean, you know, your husband's going through hell. You are trying your absolute damnedest to get him out. Was there concern that by highlighting what had happened to him, it might make it worse for him in the same way that he knew that fighting against it might make it worse? Absolutely. And 
I had this fear throughout the whole six or seven months. Yeah. Um, that's also in his best interests is that I was trying to cooperate with the Foreign Office and the UAE authorities, mm -hmm. listen to what they wanted me to do or what they were advising me to do. Um, but the second I went public, I really did it because Matt was being taken to court. Yeah. Um, and then I said, OK, he hasn't done anything. I've been cooperative in the interest of allowing for his release. And now he's been taken to court. And on top of everything, they're blaming him for something that he's yeah. never done. And, and what, and what was that, that was moment it. like for you when he got life imprisonment? No one ever prepares you for it. I mean, no one ever prepares anyone for this kind of situation, but definitely not to see your husband uh, sentenced to life in prison. It wasn't easy at all. It's probably the hardest moment I've ever had to live. Um, I've always had, I've always been very strong and very resilient, but those few hours um, after I, I heard about his sentence, were complete madness. I, I generally didn't know what else I could do, and I was desperate. There was outrage, and Jeremy Hunt got pretty vocal about this, and then, you know, miraculously, uh, you were suddenly pardoned mm -hmm. and allowed to come home. I mean, all the despair and horror of the life imprisonment moment, I guess in that moment, must have been replaced by just utter joy and relief. Uh, not, not immediately because you never really truly believe it. I, I didn't trust anything until mm. I was on the plane and the plane was in the air. And even then I, I couldn't sleep for a few days. And that moment when you're on the plane mm -hmm. and you're actually flying home to here, mm. to your home, what were you thinking on that flight? I tried not to think, but it, it was um, confusing. I had no clue what, what and why things had happened in the you way didn't know they what had. You know what to think. You're no. just too scrambled by it all. Even now, it's it, it's hard to, to acknowledge things. It's hard to... Well, so you've been through a trauma. I mean, that's really what you've been through, right? Yeah. This is a huge emotional and physical trauma, I'd imagine. Daniel, for you, though, when he finally got home and you knew he was safe and you got your life back and you got your marriage back, what was that like for you? I don't think either of us have been able to process it still. Um, it was very traumatic for, for the two of us, for our friends, for our family, for Matt's colleagues in academia. All the uncertainty of the situation, but also the months of wait, not knowing what we could do to help or when this situation would come to an end. We're obviously over the moon to be back together, mm. but our lives aren't back yet. Mm. There's still been that shadow uh, of doubt cast upon Matt's academic And you want, to clear, you want to clear his name. And that's our, yeah. I mean, our main priority really is Matt's Reputation. physical and recover, uh, recovery, but <laughs> in parallel with that is clearing his name so yeah. that there's no doubt about his, also, his legitimacy. Also, you, um, you now can spend Christmas together, but yeah. you're very aware, Daniela, of the case of uh, Nazanin Ratcliffe and her husband, who faces a third Christmas without her. Um, and there are carols, aren't there, today at Downing Street, where you're all going to be together, but without Nazanin. Different country, Iran, different rules. What hope do you think he can take from what's happened with Matt? There is hope. Um, and I think the whole point of tonight is to not just give Richard and Nazanin hope, but the families of many other victims of mm. arbitrary imprisonment abroad, um, to, to let them know that they're not alone and that they're not forgotten. Mm. And that in the same way that the British public and they stood with me as a family to defend Matt, we will do the same and we will not allow, allow for them to be forgotten uh, until they're back and safe like Matt is. Mm. Such a well, look, powerful uh, message. Very glad you're home. Uh, and our thoughts still with Richard and, and Nazanin, obviously, it's a terrible situation. And we've got to give credit, I think, to Jeremy Hunt, because I think he, he was definitely helpful in your case.
We give you know these ministers a hard time all the time. Of course. Um, but I think that he definitely said the right things at the right time and obviously pulled some of the right levers and, and got some action. So but thank God, goodness good you put your head above the parapet and fought for your husband to come. Well, home. yeah, and we're very, very grateful to, to Jeremy Hunt. His intervention was really critical yeah. at a time that it was really needed. So good to see you back together. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a good Christmas. Thanks a lot. Good to see you both.